uh, moderator, my colleagues on the elevated platform, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I wish to thank the resident director of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Ghana and the committee of fellows of the Institute of Law and Public Affairs for asking me to be part of this CS Accra dialogue. As a former member of the Electoral Commission, I wish to start with a disclaimer. I speak for myself and not for any other member of the Commission, past or present. The moderator, I read in the topic for our dialogue, consolidating Ghana's democratic governance, the assumption, which I consider to be correct, that some progress has been made. So the issue is how to consolidate the gains and forge on towards democratic governance. I do not intend to offer a definition of democratic governance, except to say that I take it that the basic elements of Ghana's democratic governance are to be found in our constitution and other relevant laws, even though they may not thereby be cast in gold and the parameters may therefore be subject to further refinement and expansion. Let me also say that I view democratic governance as an ideal to strive for, and the journey towards it as a long one, perhaps an unending one, as even advanced democracies continually seek improvement to their democratic infrastructure. Again, the foregoing backdrop, in my view, stated in one sentence, the role of the Electoral Commission in consolidating Ghana's democratic governance is to institutionalize electoral democracy. That is, the ability of the Ghanaian people to genuinely and freely choose their leaders by their votes at democratic elections. I must say straight away, that even though by law the Electoral Commission plays a leading role in establishing electoral democracy, it cannot do so all alone. It must, of necessity, build durable partnerships with relevant stakeholders. If my view is correct, our first concern should be whether, as an institution, the Electoral Commission is well equipped to play the lead role in consolidating electoral democracy. As a moderator, for an election management body to be able to function well, it needs a sound legal framework and adequate operational capacity. How does the Electoral Commission of Ghana measure to this test? In terms of the legal framework, in doing its work, the Commission is insulated from the direction or control of any person or authority. The functions and powers of the Commission and the requirements for people to participate in electoral activities are clearly spelled out. There is security of tenure for the commissioners and technical staff alike against summary dismissal. The Commission has power to make subsidiary legislation in fairness of this work. There are mechanisms for the resolution of election dispute, including access to the courts. The expenses of the Commission are charged on the consolidated fund and the Commission has its own workers in consultation with the Public Services Commission. In terms of operational capacity, the Commission has created a transparent framework for doing its work. It is able to plan its programs and activities 
in a detailed and coherent manner. It has well-trained officers who have the requisite professional skills to do their work. And the Commission makes appropriate use of technology in its work. In my view then, the Electoral Commission has a sound legal framework as well as adequate operational capacity to function well. So we can say that in principle, it is well positioned to pursue the agenda of consolidating electoral democracy. Mr. Moderator, it is to be noted that the Electoral Commission is responsible for practically everything that has to do with elections in Ghana. In summary, it demarcates constituencies, sets polling stations, registers voters, educates voters, registers political parties, sets election dates, and conducts elections and declares their results. Obviously, all these functions are important and must be performed well. But for purposes of the dialogue today, I wish to point out and briefly speak to five tasks that I consider to be particularly pertinent to the consolidation of electoral democracy. The first task is for the Commission to get the voters register right. There are many issues related to the making of the voters register, but the most difficult has to do with voter identification. The essence of voter identification is to establish the true identity of the prospective voter as the person he or she claims to be at the point of registration and at the point of voting. Over the years, the Commission used various means in trying to achieve this, including using party representatives to resolve challenges concerning eligibility for registration. But voter identification continued to be problematic and often gave rise to allegations of voter impersonation, that is, people using the names of other people, living or dead, to vote. Nowadays, biometric technology is used at both points, the point of registration and the point of voting, to ensure that the person who is voting is the same person who registered, thus solving the problem of voter impersonation. As a moderator, I'm confident that with time, more technology will be introduced into the administration of our elections, and rightly so, because generally, technology has proved to be of great assistance in election administration. For example, it has been used to manage large-scale data to compile and transmit election results quickly, to provide stakeholders with copies of data, and to make information available to interested persons on a website. In introducing technology into election administration in the past, the Electoral Commission was guided by the parado paradoxical dictum of making haste slowly. The reason is that the context, setting, or environment into which one introduces technology is important, particularly in respect of voting, the counting of votes, and the compilation and transmission of election results. The processes associated with the technology must be easy to understand and use, must be secure and sustainable, must contain sufficient safeguards to ensure transparency, fairness, and accuracy. In addition, the outputs of the technology must be auditable. In a nutshell, in making haste slowly, the Electoral Commission was of the view 
that any technology introduced into election administration needs to be user-friendly and secure. And if one cannot build a firewall around what the technology is intended to achieve, it is, it is prudent not to introduce it. The second task is for the Electoral Commission to establish a robust electoral system. As a moderator, an electoral system is robust in the extent to which it can prevent cheating by politicians and voters, as well as deliberate wrongdoing by election officials. In my view, the EC has gone a long way towards creating a transparent electoral system with inbuilt integrity such that it is virtually impossible to cheat without detection. Let me briefly describe the characteristics of the system in four steps. One, political parties are given representation at every key point in the electoral process, including voter registration, ballot printing, transportation of sensitive materials, and voting. Two, the overall outcomes of the system are verifiable. That is to say, we can ascertain the authenticity of the outputs of the various processes, and we can trace any misdeed to the point where it occurred. There is always an audit trail of election materials as they are moved from the head office through the regions to the districts, and to the polling stations. And four, during elections, there are clear guidelines as to valid and invalid votes. The counting of votes is done at every polling station in the presence of the agents of the candidates. The results are certified by the presiding officer as well as the agents of the candidates, each of whom gets a copy of the certified results. And then the results are publicly de um, declared at the polling station. So moderator, in a meaningful sense, that is the end of the election. Because from then on, what happens is simply harden up the votes obtained by each candidate in all the polling stations in the respective constituency. Any mistake or wrongdoing committed in the votes collision process are detectable and correctable. That is why the Commission has said time and again that under our electoral system, elections are won or lost at the polling stations and not in the Commission's offices. And I think the political parties now believe it, judging from the way they are trying to organize themselves at the polling station level. Again, it is possible for a well-organized party to know from the polling station results of the agents how it is faring not long after the close of the poll. However, the incipient practice of political parties announcing winners ahead of the returning officer is to be discouraged to avoid unnecessary tension and possible chaos. The third task for the Electoral Commission is to educate the people well. In this effort, the Electoral Commission distinguishes between voter education and electoral education. Every voter needs voter education, every voter. So the content is the same for all. On the other hand, electoral education seeks to give specific groups like the police, party agents, journalists, and judges the knowledge they require for effective participation in the electoral process. 
so the content varies. Generally, voter and electoral education are seen as tools for building confidence and trust. The cardinal problem about educating the people is that resources are not provided to prosecute it on a continuous basis. So it has become a seasonal activity, thereby making it less effective. 